Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome CHCI CVS Health Graduate Fellow, Michelle Gadamez. Good afternoon, buenas tardes. My name is Michelle Galdames. I'm the CHCI CVS Health Graduate Fellow. I am delighted to be with you today for the Achieving Equity, a discussion on racism as a public health issue session. I'm a proud immigrant from El Salvador and a committed health equity advocate. This is an overdue conversation, racism, is a barrier among immigrants and other underrepresented groups. On behalf of CHCI, I would like to, to thank Johnson & Johnson, Amgen, Commonwealth Fund, and Gen & Tech for their generous support of this session. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Congresswoman Robin Kelly from Illinois' second district. Congresswoman Kelly has worked to expand economic opportunity, community wellness, and public safety across the state, championing numerous initiatives to generate job, job growth, reduce health disparities, and end gun violence. She is vice chair of the House Energy and Commerce Committee and serves on the Health, Energy, and Consumer Protection and Commerce Subcommittees committed to improving the health and wellness of vulnerable communities across the country, Congresswoman Kelly serves as a chair of the Congressional Black Caucus Health Brain Trust and co-chairs the Congressional Caucus on Black Women and Girls. Please welcome Congresswoman Kelly. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Michelle, who I'm so proud to say is my health fellow. So thank you guys so much. Thanks to the CHCI. Thank you for inviting me to speak to you for this very important conversation on health equity. I also want to thank the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute for organizing this event. And I'm so happy uh, on com the committee I'm on, the Vice Chair of Energy and Commerce, I'm also on with Rep. Raul Ruiz, Danette Batagon, uh, Darren Soto, and Tony Cardenas. And actually, we're in a markup right now, so that may be why you don't see them, and I'm going to run off so I can vote. It's an honor to represent the people of Illinois' 2nd Congressional District and to represent the Congressional Black Caucus as chair of the Health Brain Trust. The focus of today's conversation is to discuss racism as a public health issue. This is a very timely event. For too long, people of color have been left behind and excluded from quality, affordable health care. Together, we are going to change that. Healthcare access is one of the most important and challenging issues facing American families. We all want to keep ourselves and our families healthy, but too often families experience barriers to care, lack of access to care, or unaffordable care. We need to work towards promoting health equity in our communities, increasing diversity within the ranks of healthcare providers, and expanding innovation at the intersection of technology, healthcare, and telemedicine. The COVID-19 pandemic has only shed more light on how pervasive health disparities are across the country. The pandemic has disproportionately affected Black, Indigenous, and Latino communities, all of whom have experienced higher rates of COVID-19 hospitalizations and death. In Congress, as a chair of the Congressional Black Caucus Health Brain Trust and a member of the Energy and Commerce Health Subcommittee, I am deeply invested in closing the gap on health disparities. This includes diversifying clinical trials to that end. I have introduced the Clinical Trial Diversity Act, which would establish goals to include underrepresented populations in NIH-funded clinical trials. Finally, I want to encourage you to all continue this important work as policymakers, pharmaceutical manufacturers, developers, researchers, practitioners, and public health specialists, you have the opportunity to improve our clinical trials, increase equitable healthcare access, and help to eliminate health inequities. Thank you so much for all that you do, and have a great lunch. Take care. Thank you so much, Congresswoman, for those remarks. 
the honor is mine to be in, in your office. Now I would like to introduce Frank Rodriguez from Johnson & Johnson. Frank is leading Johnson's 100 million enterprise commitment for our race to health equity focused on addressing health inequities among the US communities of color. He recently was the senior director, Americas for the Global Community Impact Team, leading the company's social impact work for the past five years. Frank has been with Johnson & Johnson for more than 20 years, and he has worked across numerous roles in marketing and human resources before coming to Global Community Impact. Please welcome Frank Rodriguez. Good afternoon, everybody. And thank you, Michelle. My name is Frank Rodriguez, and I uh, do work for Johnson Johnson. I have the pleasure of leading our race to health equity. It's an honor to really strengthen our relationship with the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute and support today's annual leadership conference session on racism as a public health threat. We want to thank Representative Robin Kelly for kicking off today's discussion and her tireless leadership in addressing critical healthcare issues impacting communities of color. I also like to thank CHCI, my fellow sponsors and speakers, and all of you today for supporting this critically important discussion. And I think Congresswoman really talked about just the importance of it to her, I think to everybody in this, this room. I'm honored to be among such distinguished congressional, business, and community leaders as we come together to celebrate Latino excellence and to address our community's most pressing needs. For all Latinos, one of our most basic and critical needs is access to quality health care. As one of the largest healthcare companies in the world, Johnson Johnson is committed to changing the culture of health care so that it meets the needs of all of our communities. As part of our race to health equity, we're working to eradicate racial health equities and addressing the harsh reality the Hispanic and BIPOC communities know all too well, that the color of our skin at times determines our access to care, quality of care, and health outcomes. We are keenly aware that no single organization like J&J can tackle this work. We value the opportunity to create enduring alliances, and we're here today to partner with and learn from leading organizations like CHCI, our government, corporate and community partners who've been doing this work for decades. Johnson Johnson believes that when all communities have a seat at the table and we all work together, we're, we can really be change agents for healthcare and beyond. And it leads definitely to healthier outcomes for all our communities. We also know that a healthcare workforce that more closely reflects our diversity and understands our culture and specific needs will help cultivate more innovative and more inclusive solutions that will result in healthier outcomes for all Latinos. To that end, we recently supported legislation that seeks to eliminate barriers to participate in clinical trials. And we are also supporting efforts to increase Latino physicians to lead clinical research. We're also leading bilingual vaccine education efforts and supporting Hispanic physicians and community leaders to serve as spokespeople for vaccine education. Additionally, we're also providing support for community health centers nationwide, which, on the, which are on the front lines and providing care for over 34 million people, and many, as we know, for the most medically underserved communities around the US. Thank you for all your time. I look forward to expanding the work we do together for the betterment of our communities. Let's rebuild the culture of healthcare together, as Congresswoman just talked about, so that every one of us in our future generations can live longer, healthier lives. Lives in which we can celebrate our rich history, build on the legacy of our leaders and our parents, and help the next generation pursue its own version of the American dream. Thank you and buen provecho. Thank you for being here with us today, Frank. Now, before we resume our program, we will pause for our lunch break. So please enjoy, y buen provecho.
Why didn't the doctor believe me? Did I say something wrong? Do we have to experience the same pain and bias as our parents and grandparents? What if they actually gave us access to those clinical studies we learned about and those cutting edge medicines? What if we ask the bigger questions? People of color still do not receive equal access to healthcare. We're determined to change this. Join us. Please help me welcome our moderator, Dr. Adolfo Cuevas. Dr. Cuevas is an assistant professor in the Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences at NYU's School of Global Public Health, an advisory board member in the Center for Anti-Racism, Social Justice, and Public Health at NYU. Prior to joining NYU, Dr. Cuevas was the Gerald R. Gill Assistant Professor of Race, Culture, and Society at Tufts University Department of Community Health. As a community psychologist, Dr. Cuevas employs epidemiological, psychological, and biological approaches to investigate the interrelationship between race, ethnicity, racism, discrimination, and health. We are thrilled to have Adolfo join us today to, le to lead this critical dialogue. So please welcome him. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm honored uh, to be here with all of you today uh, for this very important discussion about the intersection of health and race. Um, I would like to first begin uh, by sharing a quote with you from uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., uh, where he states, of all the forms of inequality, injustice in health is the most shocking and the most inhuman because it often results in physical death. And this was in response to the striking and shocking disparities that we typically see uh, in health when it comes to race, ethnicity. And while medical advancements and technologies have improved uh, disparities in many different uh, aspects of, of health outcomes when it comes to heart disease, diabetes, and even life expectancy, uh, we still see many of these disparities uh, today. When it comes to black and white disparities, is about uh, a five-year difference. And, and there are researchers who actually have found out that if you were to actually hold the life expectancy of white uh, individuals constant, it'll take about 35 years for, for black Americans to catch up. And when you look into the disparities between the Hispanic Latino community and white Americans, even though Hispanics basically experienced a, 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 an advantage in life expectancy in recent years, this has basically been washed away uh, by the consequences of, of COVID-19. Uh, life expectancy for Hispanic Latinos have dropped uh, three years on average. And this is really contingent upon uh, state, uh, national level versus state level. If you look at state level, uh, even in California, the, these disparities have uh, been quite striking where uh, Hispanic Californians uh, have uh, lost life expectancy of up to six years. Why is this? A, a lot of researchers in the uh, 1990s and early 2000s have basically uh, implicated socioeconomic disadvantage as a contributing factor to racial and ethnic disparities. But if you were to actually hold these things constant, or just for them statistically, these disparities continue to persist. And so this basically begs that there's another social determinant that's contributing to racial ethnic differences in health. And this is really where it comes down to is racism and how racism actually contributes to much of the disparities that we see today. We have a wonderful uh, panel uh, today uh, who's gonna be talking about this particular issue, this really hot topic issue of racism in public health. Uh, I'll first would like to introduce to you uh, Dr. Scott Heimlich, uh, president of Amgen Foundation. Dr. Heimlich is uh, president of, of uh, Amgen Foundation and executive director of corporate affairs for Amgen. He is responsible for the strategic management and direction of the foundation's portfolio, including the development and oversight of key initiatives at the K through 12 and higher education levels. 
Thank you for coming. Next, uh, we have Dr. Maria Portela Martinez. Uh, Dr. Portela Martinez is Assistant Professor, Chief of Family Medicine, Bridge to Care Medical Director at George Washington University School of Medicine and Health Sciences. She is also co-principal investigator of the Health Workforce Diversity Initiative and Diversity Tracker, and part of the Beyond Flexner Alliance uh, leadership team. Thank you. Next, uh, let's welcome Dr. Jacqueline Duget. Dr. Duget is a pediatrician with over 20 years of experience, speaker, writer, and founder of What is Black podcast. I should also add, uh, she's uh, formerly served as the Deputy Health uh, Officer at the Frederick County Health Department and Bureau Director and Medical Director of Maternal Child Health at the Howard County Health Department. So another round of applause for her. Uh, and uh, last but not least, uh, we have Dr. Fabian Sandoval, uh, President and CEO of Emerson uh, Clinical Research Institute. Uh, Dr. Sandoval has over 25 years of bench to bedside research experience. His diversified research career has been in academia, healthcare systems, and the public sector. Please uh, welcome uh, Dr. Fabian Sandoval and the rest of our panelists. So uh, I would first uh, like to begin by um, basically defining uh, what is uh, racism. And I, and I use uh, a particular definition by uh, Dr. Bonija uh, Silva, um, where he basically defines racism as an organized system that disadvantages one particular racial group uh, over the other. And this basically suggests that racism is a multi-dimensional construct that really operates at different levels and at different social settings. And, and given that you are in very distinct fields, I, I would first like to hear from you, uh, first, the, the disparities that you actually see within your own uh, respective fields and how racism really operates to contribute to many of these uh, disparities. And so I'll, I'll first would like to begin with uh, Dr. Heimlich. Sure. Uh, I think the you know, biggest focus for us is the fact that this, the systemic nature of this issue, the fact that it's structural. Um, Amgen has a deep commitment to health equity. Uh, we are focused on reducing disparities in health access and health outcomes and focus on rep, um, representative product development in terms of clinical trial diversity, comprehensive health education in terms of giving folks the information they need to make effective healthcare decisions, as well as accessible and, inclus and inclusive healthcare. Having said all of that, the fact of the matter is many Americans, when they think about this, they're thinking about interpersonal racism or even internalized racism, but don't always understand systemic racism and the effect that has on public health. And so it's great to see this panel today on racism as a public health issue. Great. Dr. Portela Martinez? Sure. I think you specifically asked also about the representation and how we see it in our respective fields. One of the, the focuses that we're looking at GW through the Health Workforce Diversity Initiative is how can we highlight some of these disparities in the workforce? that are related to underrepresentation of racial and ethnic minorities and other, other minorities? And how can we present the data in innovative or catchy ways to drive home the point that the disparities, some of them are getting worse and some of them haven't really improved much in the last couple of decades. And one of their issues and big underlying issue is structural racism. How can we move the needle by presenting data in a clear, transparent way and put it in the hands of uh, policymakers? And one of the things that we have found, which is probably no big surprise to anybody in the room, is that out of 15 health professions, the most common health diagnosing um, professions and educations, Hispanics are basically underrepresented in all of them, but they're also underrepresented um, in a very profound way, more than 200% uh, underrepresentation. Um, that underrepresentation varies by Hispanic subgroup and by 
time of um, residence in the US and different factors, but the underrepresentation is still the common thread. And I think one of the ways that we can change that is by addressing structural racism and also by raising awareness um, about the, how, how bad the disparities are and how those disparities actually translate in health outcomes for our communities. Excellent. Uh, Dr. Duje? Um, so, so how it shows up um, in my field of work being a pediatrician is when I think about, um, when we talk about adult, um, adult diseases and the disparities that exist with adult diseases, many of the root causes of those disparities starts in childhood, okay? So we know that right now, you know, from the 2020 census or so, we have over 70 million um, children, represent, there are over 70 million children, right, that are in the United States, and that represents about 20% of the population. And if we look at that even percentage of the population, we look at, we, look at, we have like the most diverse group of children, right? So um, children of color make up more than 50% of children in the United States, and when we look at um, health disparities, right, this concept of, um, I know in training about, you know, mm -hmm. presenting a patient as a four-year-old black child or a 15-year-old Hispanic child, um, it puts the context of the condition and that person in a racialized lens and leads us to think that, okay, race has something to do, or gender has something to do with why that patient is in the position that they're in, but not understanding that it is the systems and structures in which that person lives, works, plays, worships, um, interacts with other people that impacts why that person is where they are. So this idea of changing the perspective and the context of why a person um, has a health need as opposed to um, putting them in the position of just a number, a race, sex, these, these, these siloed identities makes a difference. And, and I think how we, how we treat children and understanding that, again, the, what children experience has a long-term impact in terms of their, um, their, their, their health outcomes, especially as throughout their course and their lifespan. Excellent. <clears throat> and, and last but not least, Dr. Sandoval. Thank you. Um, buen provecho. Um, I think you guys all need lots of coffee after you've had this delicious lunch so you don't fall asleep. I'm going to try and keep you awake as well as my panelists here. Um, so let's talk a little bit about this systemic racism. And let's hit a little bit back and talk about history. As a clinical researcher, I always talk about the Belmont Report, right? Belmont Report, Beneficence, Respect for Persons, and Justice, right? What's going to happen with justice? That means just because you're a particular um, background, you should or should not be in a study. It starts with that. It's the ability for us to say everyone should be in a research study. Everyone has the opportunity and not just use one individual, right? Maybe you want to hit history a little bit further back. What happened with um, the Tuskegee syphilis trial? Let's talk about Nuremberg trials, right? With um, uh, acts against humanity in, in research with the Nazis. All of this is a systemic form of racism. But what's more important, it's not just that. It's how do we educate so that it doesn't continue to happen? How do we tell our Hispanic patients, you should participate in a research study. These are the benefits to you. These are the benefits to our community. And if we don't openly discuss this, it's going to continue. So this idea of, of this uh, unconscious bias of racism really is pretty conscious. And we need to say it the way it is Maybe, and I've had this discussion with other colleagues who say, is it really? Well, you look a particular way, well, we might not really talk to that patient about that study. Mm -hmm. Well, man, you're being racist. Just offer the study to this individual. And, and I take this based on, on some guidance and someone that I admired, uh, Dr. Edith Mitchell, uh, who mentions this a lot of you know, calling it what it is. So we need to stop it and we need to move it forward. And we have seen it time and time again. That's, a, that's an excellent point, and, and I think this is a really nice segue in, into educating uh, the public. It, you, you bring up a good point in terms of just, just the nation in general and how we're pretty ahistorical and we forget how policies have shaped not only the social experiences but the, even the health outcomes of, of not only individuals but groups of individuals. 
uh, when it comes to mortgage discrimination, segregation that still persists to, to today, when we look into aspects of redlining, how that actually still affects not only cancer diagnoses, but a wide range of different health outcomes. And because of this, it creates, it creates a culture of racism that, that is oftentimes reinforced through interpersonal discrimination. There's a, a, a particular uh, study that comes out every year. It's called the General Social Survey, uh, where they basically survey uh, the, the nation about specific questions related to race relations. And, and less than half of the population uh, believe uh, that discrimination contributes to disparities. So there is a, a lot of work to be done to educate uh, the public. So I guess, you know, what can be done uh, to educate more Americans about how racism operates, uh, specifically within the context of public health? And I'll begin with uh, Dr. Heimlich, uh, who's basically been you know, within the realm of education for quite some time. Absolutely. And I would first say, for those of you that have read The Color of Law, if you want to learn about the history of the state-sanctioned uh, segregation in this country, it's a wonderful book. On the education front, though, at the Amgen Foundation, we focus on science education. Um, we have a platform I'll just briefly speak about with Harvard University called Lab Exchange. It's lab, the letter X, and the word change.org. On that platform, after the murder of George Floyd, when we discuss what could we do around racial diversity, equity, and inclusion in science, in health, and education, uh, we convened a panel of experts from HBCUs and other universities across the nation who brought together about 50 postdocs and we're building out a whole section on racism as a public health crisis. One of the issues with surveys like those results uh, our moderator just mentioned is that many Americans are simply unaware of the disparities and inequities that exist across America with regard to healthcare, with regard to education, with regard to so many other topics. On Lab Exchange, we are building the content of what these experts are providing through simulations, through interactives, through a number of other uh, assets that are gonna be helpful in speaking for teachers, for the public, and for others to identify systemic racism when they see it, to be more aware of the many facts, the, the dismal facts, the unacceptable facts of the disparities that exist in public health, and then ideally be able to not just identify, but to transform uh, and engage with those structures. So if you have a chance, uh, labexchange.org uh, has a cluster of materials called Racism as a Public Health Crisis that's coming soon. I'd appreciate the chance to answer that question. Yeah, and, and actually a quick follow-up to that. Have you uh, experienced any challenges in kind of engaging in, in this kind of work? Uh, so we are developing the materials. When those materials go live, I can mm -hmm, imagine, mm -hmm. yes, there, there are obviously many voices out there with respect to uh, these issues, yes. uh, but it's it's something that it's critical yeah. that more people are educated and aware, and I guess the word I would use is are more literate about the history of uh, um, what has happened and, and really about the disparities that exist today. Wonderful. Wonder and actually, then I'll, I'll pose a question to you, Dr. Portel Martinez. Sure. Well, at uh, George Washington University, one of, the, one of my roles is being part of the Beyond Flexner Alliance, which is a social mission movement and health professions education organization. And through that, we focus on a couple of pillars. One of them is education and raising awareness of the issues that lead to um, health professions, educations and practice, steering away from um, social mission, including not being anti-racist and uh, not focusing on diversity and inclusion, among other things like focusing on what type of uh, health workforce does the country need and um, helping uh, schools be able to create more opportunities to, for students to learn about primary care and go into fields uh, and into underserved areas or areas that don't have enough uh, um, healthcare professionals. So through that organization, they actually fund part of our, our Health Workforce Diversity Initiative and through the Health Workforce or Diversity Initiative, we try to disseminate how bad of a problem we have in terms of the underrepresentation of the workforce and essentially associate one of the main issues that's related to that is likely structural racism, right? So in the, in the sense that when we ask why haven't we been able to see significant improvement in some of these fields is because not one single program 
or one single solution is going to help kind of solve the problem. It has to be a multi-pronged approach. So in terms of the research, we are really looking at different health professions, uh, schools, and we're essentially giving them a grade about how they're doing in terms of their diversity and inclusion efforts. So we're looking at how many students are actually in their class per health profession and how many students are graduating. And then how many students in the, in the US belong to that specific racial and ethnic group. So disseminating those results, we hope we're can increasing transparency and accountability of a direct byproduct of uh, structural racism. Mm -hmm. And then the last thing that we're doing that we're trying to grow in is to create a space where we help change culture of organizations, including our own. So through that, we created the GW Anti-Racism Coalition, but more so we're trying to create a stakeholder engagement um, practice lab where we invite other institutions that have denounced themselves as anti-racist that have current active curriculums on those areas. And we try to learn about what things they're doing that are working in those spaces with the hope of one, um, helping uh, highlight their work and uh, further their work by collaborating together, but two, also disseminating those results with other institutions to hopefully um, inspire others to do similar work. That's wonderful, and, and it seems like there's a connection there with, with even communities, as, as you mentioned, with like stakeholder engagement. And that's very similar then to Dr. Duget's kind of work with communities and, and the healthcare system. I'm wondering if you could kind of share some of the work that's being done within the healthcare realm. Oh, certainly, and I, I agree with, with both um, the prior, prior speakers that, um, you know, the work that's really being done. So again, working more of my work with the American Academy of Pediatrics to, um, to advance equity, right? So an organization, I think, first has to, I think in a forum like this, or you have to talk about it, right? You have to acknowledge that racism is a root cause of health inequities and that it has to be addressed, right? And I think if you, if you don't have, a, have an understanding that that's where we need to start, I mean, there are other, thing, other areas too that need to be addressed, but in, in this context, talking about racism and structural racism. So I think, you know, I think some of the wonderful things that the American Academy of Pediatrics is doing or has done, um, myself and two of my co-authors, um, Dr. Maria Trent and Dr. Daniel Dooley, they were the lead authors on a seminal policy statement right, about the impact of racism on children and adolescent health. And the fact that we wrote that policy and it's been downloaded so many times and you know, I'm always, when I'm, when I'm writing something and I'm like, oh, it was cited someplace else that I'm now wanting to cite in a paper that I'm doing. Um, the American Academy of Pediatrics has um, written a truth and reconciliation, right? Acknowledging their history, right? Um, so I think more medical societies are doing that as well. ACOG, like obstetricians, family practitioners, um, the American Medical Association. Because I mean, if you think about the history of many of these medical associations, many of us would not have even been doctors, okay? We weren't, in, we weren't mm -hmm. entered into the club. So, you know, there's been progress. I think in other, other important things that are being done are, you know, equity agendas, right? But beyond just, beyond just on paper and policies and, you know, nice, nice papers, leaning into actually doing the work, right? We have people, we have providers that are being supported and, and highlighted to do the work, but also providing tools. And I think that's gonna be important. I think acknowledging it, and I just wanna say one other thing, because I'm a pediatrician, I think we do need to invest more in maternal child health. Because if our children don't start, you know, but Frederick Douglass has a saying, right? Um, I'm not good with these quotes. Um, but it's better to, to build, um, it's important to have strong men, right? I forget, so you can look up the quote. You can look up the quote, okay? But it's important, right? Because if our kids don't start out well, right? If we don't start out on, and it's not about equality, right? It's not just about equality. I think we're always thinking about, oh, we're out, we want an equal society. I don't want an equal society. I want a just society. I want to push it past equity. I want a just society. I want a society where, you know what? It's okay to have these conversations and not be embarrassed about them, right? Where we can say to ourselves, oh man, I, 
I ha I now now my, what, what's an unconscious bias is now a conscious bias, and I'm going to make a change and do whatever I can to engage and make sure that I make the change, not just for myself, but whoever I'm serving and and and, and interacting with. That's that's wonderful, and, and I was going to help you with the quote, but I would have butchered it myself as well. But, yeah, I have, but I, and I have an <laughs> iPad. I could have just looked it up, but it's a great quote. Yeah. It's a great quote. Uh, Dr. Sandoval, you, sure. you also have a very unique approaches to really disseminating information, mm -hmm. especially educating the public about uh, anti-racism, racism in health, and, and love to just hear from you as well in terms of what are some of these unique approaches you've engaged in. Sure, thank you. Um, so my uh, quote has always been a, a healthy patient is an educated patient, right? Mm -hmm. Education promotes health. And it doesn't mean going off and getting advanced degrees. It's being able to talk to a patient and tell him or her what they have, right? Um, and if a patient is well-educated, regardless of their educational level, they can talk to their provider and say, these are the issues that I have. These are the issues that I've learned. So, so that they disrupt that bias of, well, they really don't understand what I'm talking about. We can teach patients with very simple terms how to talk to other providers. What do we do? Um, so. Uh, our research institute has a foundation called the Emerson Diversity Health Foundation. Through our foundation, we actually work with the consulates of Mexico, Guatemala, Salvador, Honduras, Peru, and there's one more missing, I think there's six, um, Colombia, every once in a while. What do we do? I have staff at those locations that meet with patients and actively engages them. Let's talk about your diabetes. When was the last time you had your blood pressure checked? Do you have glaucoma? Do you even know what glaucoma looks like? Let's talk about it, and we do quick little screens and educate them while they're, act, while they're passively sitting there waiting for their number to get called so that they can get their passports, birth certificates, what have you. That's the first thing we do. The second thing we do through our foundation I'm very proud of is I started a TV show that airs on Telemundo. You guys should look it up and follow and do all that stuff. Uh, on Telemundo, called Tu Salud, Tu Familia, Your Health, Your Family. We've been on air now for three years. In those three years, been great. Thank you. I decided to educate patients in a fun way. Our demographics hits. I used to say from 18 and above until I was at uh, one of our health fairs and this little girl came up, Dr. Fabian, Dr. Fabian, I watch you. And she says that she watches me with her grandma, which is awesome. So that is the education. Just like you said, start young to teach them young things and they can learn. So our TV show airs every Saturday. We have uh, 120,000 homes that watch us, and it's worked. And the reason why it's worked is because people now understand, and we talk to patients in terms that they understand, but not down to a patient, which is another issue with racism. Mm -hmm. People just think, just because I'm a particular, I don't understand what you're saying, or because I have an accent, I don't understand what you're saying. All that has to do with it. So on our show, I talk to my patients and their terminology, but then I raise the bar a little bit because they need to. We all need to learn medical terminology that's more efficient. Legal stuff, I don't know any legal terms. I need to learn legal terms. So teach me those little legal terms. And you know, the last plug on our show is that we have done so well that I'm proud to say that the short time that we've been on air, we have won three Emmys. That means we're teaching people something. Yeah. Well, well, then this kind of gets to my, my next question. Uh, when it comes to discussions about racism, it usually takes place at the individual or interpersonal level. Uh, and, and many interventions, as many of us know, always happens at those levels in terms of stress management technique or improving race relations. And, and while these are great, uh, it, it really places the burden on, on the victims of racism and discrimination and never addresses some of the core issues when it comes to wealth disparities. It, actually, one of the biggest wealth disparities that we typically see is in Boston, where the net worth of a white family is about $254,000, whereas uh, the net worth of a black family is $8. I, again, I'll mention this again. So net worth of a white family is about $254,000, whereas the net worth of a black family is $8. Th these disparities are again are due to historical and contemporary experiences of uh, systemic racism. And yet, we, we're developing constantly stress management techniques 
and, and uh, ways to kind of improve race, race relations and never get to the core. And so I'm wondering, and I'll open up to, to any of the panelists, um, how can we begin to actually reframe uh, these discussions about racism, moving it away from individual and interpersonal and more to, uh, talking about uh, systemic issues? I would it's just started, I think COVID is a great example, a horrible example, but a great example where they're, you're not talking about internalized racism where someone thinks they're more than or less than. You're not talking about interpersonal racism. You're not talking about institutional racism where it's one law firm or one university department. Mm -hmm. That's a situation where those disparities that we see in public health with COVID with certain populations is clearly a result of many different variables. Um, an education professor used to talk about the cumulative multivariate process and talking about why colleges students persist or don't. Mm -hmm. Here, the same thing, many different things, historical and, and current, have accumulated. And all of these things together have resulted in these horrid disparities we see, whether it's the wealth gap, education, health. Um, and it just goes back to this discussion about what is um, a way to best make folks more aware and educated. I love the comment that was made about you know, what is just. Mm -hmm. um, but even, you know, if you try to have an argument with someone around what is just or what is equity versus equality, but that person is ignorant of the disparities that are out there, you're not going to win that argument mm -hmm. because you have to understand the larger context in order to understand what is just, mm -hmm. what is equitable mm -hmm. versus the easy thing to go to around equality in, in that situation. That'd that's, be my, what I would excellent. add. That's excellent. Any, anyone else? Yeah. Oh, I would, I would just, I mean, it's true. I think, um, this idea of having, you know, individuals who are victimized, right, by racism, having to learn about it and talk about it. I mean, unfortunately, that's, it is the way it is, right? Many of us in our organizations that we serve, because we are a person of color and have, have experienced racism, we're the ones that tend to step up and step out and talk about it. And there's a price you pay for that, right? But there's also, if you don't pay the price, then you don't, you don't move anything. Um, so I think that's, that's a very interesting topic. I think there needs to be more um, organizational support. Mm -hmm. um, and not just, not just, oh, you know, I'm going to put you out there again to be the person of color that's going to talk about racism. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. this, it's got to be more than that. There needs to be mental health support. There's a toll. I mean, I can tell you personally, um, after, it's not just George Floyd's death, right? But it's the cumulative impact, right? Of the stories that you watch and you raise your children and you, then you have to separate yourself from being a provider to now I'm a human being and a parent. And then constantly talking about it and then also feeling like, oh, I'm gonna educate more people about what it's like to be a person of color or immigrant it got to be a lot, but if I didn't do it, but I also had to take the, take the time for myself and step back and, and, and address my mental health as well. So I think all those are important. And I think what's also, also important, again, coming back to, to children and families and being a pediatrician, we have to get parents to be engaged in these conversations and start talking about racism. And it's not racist to talk about racism. We have to acknowledge that kids, as long they have a, they have a developmental milestones, right? In terms of they learn to walk and talk, they learn about race early, and if you don't talk about it, if you are if you don't model for them, then they're going to learn, they're going to learn things that you don't want them to learn or you don't want them to model, right? So we've got to be engaged in having these conversations in an age-appropriate way and starting early and starting consistently. It's an important conversation to have. Um, yeah, so all of those things. So this boils down to cultural competency. What is the cultural competency that you have at home? What is the cultural competency that you have within your work environment and within, if we're talking about uh, an office, your medical practice? Uh, it's understanding that I don't have to be the same rainbow of color of the patients that come to my office, but I need to be able to understand it and be genuine when I talk to my patients about it and some, something that we in clinical trials have the luxury that uh, traditional practitioners don't have is that I can spend 20 minutes with the patient, I can spend 30 minutes with the patient. General practice has five minutes, go. Next patient's in and out. So you don't have that time to bond. We need to learn to be able to bond honestly with our patients, with our community, so that they can develop that level of trust with us and start breaking down those barriers because then we don't have just the, 
the, the mistrust of, of culture, but then we also have the mistrust of professionals. I don't trust science, you know, that's some chip and they're putting in me and I'm gonna go sterile in it. All these cheese mess that come out, right? So we have to avoid those things. And the way we do it is by having that bonding time with individuals with true, real cultural competencies. Yeah, one Wonderful. quick thing. Yes, please. I, I would echo the two previous yeah. speakers' <laughs> comments, um, <laughs> Dr. Sandoval and Dr. Rush, and I would just add that um, we talked a lot about how in our respective fields we're all involved in education to a certain extent. Some of us are involved in research. Those things are great. If you, you think about how to change human behavior, and this is very deeply tied to human behavior, education is an element and raising awareness, um, giving incentives um, that help people make uh, healthier or more appropriate choices is another way. Uh, but the one that is kind of more everlasting or not everlasting as we know, but just is policies, right? So we really yes. trying by raising education or increasing education, raising awareness, um, empowering people to advocate for themselves for the issues that they care about, more representation in the table, by allowing people to have more equal opportunities to education, they end up themselves representing at the table. And you know, if you're not at the table, you're being eaten. So we really need to increase our numbers at these leadership um, circles, right, across all sectors, like you know, health professions for sure, education, government, and we need to also um, be very vocal in terms of how we use our voice as advocates, right, for our communities. Um, and in terms of the education and research, we hope that by giving people that can make those decisions, like the policymakers, those tools, whatever it is, the graphics, the information, they will be able to also help revert or take, you know, make decisions to kind of help revert or at least have some retribution for what's going on. That's wonderful. Uh, thank you so much. I, I, I now want to open it up uh, to the audience. If, uh, if there's um, any audience member that has a, uh, a brief question, um, and even if you're an audience member that typically says I have more of a comment than a question, uh, please, please keep it uh, brief. Um, uh, this is a wonderful opportunity to ask a question to any of our panelists. Try to keep this as brief as possible. Uh, this is a, a topic very near and dear to, I'm sure, a lot of our hearts, um, whether it be through personal experience, familial experience, etc. I want to enter into the conversation the topic about anti-blackness in the Latino community and opportunities for partnership and allyship. Um, Dr. Dana Bowen Matthew has a great book, Just Medicine and Just Health, if people want to learn more about a topic like this that I feel like is really information about some of these root causes where she talks about the way that mm -hmm. really structural racism killed her mm -hmm. father, right? Mm -hmm. The implications mm -hmm. of those health mm -hmm. disparities. I would love to hear from, from you guys, whether it's from your personal experience or backgrounds or your own personal insights, as, as Latinos and frankly, as, as black and Latino individuals and intersectionality for our Afro-Latinos as well, right? This is something where there's a lot of opportunity to drive change together. And I think that um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big space that at times in a system that tries to pit us against each other or act like there isn't that overlap, um, the discussion isn't had enough. So I would love to throw that into the room for anyone or again, obviously as our moderator directs like to answer, it would be really awesome to just talk a little bit about that. Wonderful question. Anyone would like to pick this question up about anti-blackness within the Hispanic Latino community and, and, and some of the aspects of that's not really being engaged in the Latino health discourse? Hmm. Seems like we're stumped, right? Because it's a, it's a deep question. It's a question that we don't know how, I don't know how to answer because there's always segregations even within our own communities, right? Even the Los de Venezuela don't want to talk to the Colombians or Los de Cuba, right? And everyone starts to mix apart. So then we need to, at that level, start to understand what are the terms that resonates across everybody? Even simple terms like, you know, a baby bottle, right? How do you say baby bottle in Espanol? Pacha, biberon, chupo, mamila. Right? And if you don't know those, you can't intersect, right? Um, and that is part of the issue that I believe we're all confronted with is how do we then address individual patient racism activities within the Afro-Latino community, which is a whole nother, because, well, you look Hispanic, but you're African-American, you're African-American, no, so you're negrito de, 
de otro lado, right? So it's really hard for individuals, and it breaks my heart when I see that uh, happening. I sometimes, people, you know, fall back and they're like, you're Hispanic? Really? Yes, yo soy colombiano, right? But they don't understand, and that's something that we all need to break. That is a hard barrier to, 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 to go through, especially within our own communities. So I think you asked a great question that has probably left me thinking more about it. Yeah, and maybe just to add to, to your question, because I've done, you know, as an Afro-Latino, I, I, I've engaged in this kind of work on Afro-Latino health, and, and a lot of the research, you know, there's a saying, you know, research is me-search oftentimes, huh. and, and this is indeed for, for myself engaging in this kind of work, because anti-blackness within the Hispanic community is real, uh, colorism within the Hispanic community is real, and this really does affect uh, the health outcomes of our brothers and sisters within the Latino community. And when we look at it, we actually are uh, finding out clear evidence, more recent uh, than ever before, in terms of just life expectancy. Uh, Afro-Latinos tend to live shorter lives than their white Latino counterparts. Uh, when it comes to a wide range of different health outcomes, their health profile is much poorer compared to white Latinos. And this is largely driven by discrimination not only outside of the Latino community, but discrimination within the Latino community. And I think there's a lot of both discussions that needs to be had, clear mm -hmm. discussions about this within our own group uh, about these aspects and, and then really engage in the work to address many of these issues. So th thank you for asking that question. And Latinos don't belong to just one race. Like that's something mm -hmm. that I just wanna, before I walk off, like that's, that's so it. important for us to recognize, like it's what's erased other people from feeling like they can be a part of the culture, especially in America. So. How are we doing the personal work to make sure that we're challenging family, family members and challenging people about the people that we, we talk about being looking like our European ancestors. We talk about this, we talk about that, but like all, so many of us are probably mixed from African slave roots, from indigenous roots, like, and that's why we look the way that we look. Like there's no one kind of looking Latino. We have similar cultures, but America still hasn't properly addressed the fact that we aren't racially the same. And so they bucket us as an, a catch all, but we have different experiences because of that racial, like, human construct that we've created. Yeah. Okay, I'm done, sorry, but thank you so much. <laughs> um, we have uh, a chance for just one more question. I'm sorry for, for the rest of the, but the, our panelists will be here uh, after, but if you have a very brief question that, that any of the panelists can answer, the floor is yours. I have a brief question. Um, I work for a very large healthcare institution. We operate in 20 states in DC, have over 140 hospitals, over a thousand clinics. One of the roles that I'm charged with is helping an innovation group within my organization understand how we need to attune our digital health products to address the barriers that vulnerable populations face. It is overwhelming to try to educate my peers and teams about structural racism. And so my question, right, because there's so much literature and like I've digested a lot, but like I'm just beginning. And it's like, how do I distill that down in a 30 to an hour minute, an hour long meeting to give them enough information where they're like, I get it. So I'm wondering from each of you, is there a go-to article resource framework that you think can help people who have no concept of this absorb structural racism and why that's something that we need to address. And I'm specific to healthcare, but would be interested because I think it's applicable across every single interest industry. That's an excellent question. And I, I didn't pay her to be there because that was gonna be my closing question for the panelists. Uh -huh. um, and so actually we'll start off with uh, Dr. Heimley. Sure, I, I, sorry to throw out another book, but the book Cast comes to mind immediately by Isabel Wilkerson, but that is not a 30 second or one hour, it, it's, it's a book, uh, but it does an incredible job of talking about uh, caste uh, in, in America and actually comparing things to Nazi Germany and, and elsewhere. Um, I, um, I think it's a wonderful question. I think that it's hard to think about an issue like this and what could be done in a very short time period, but it's kind of exactly the type of resources that I think we need uh, to help address the disparities that, that should not exist. One thing I'll just throw out there that, you know, that comes to mind that sometimes helps to put the situation take it slightly different, you know, humans are biologically diverse. The figures that uh, our moderator mentioned earlier about New York City and the wealth gap, 
what if you just took a different uh, immutable biological characteristic like height, and you gave that figure, and you said that for everyone over six foot two, they had that amount of wealth, and everyone below six foot two did not. Sometimes changing and adopting a new lens, suddenly, oh my God, you know, why, that, that, that's horrible. I, you know, it should be horrible today as well, but just that, I heard a speaker that did that quite effectively, and it jolted some folks in, a, in the room that it gave them a different lens on thinking about uh, you know, skin color versus other characteristics that, again, as the earlier questioner said, uh, you know, it, are, are social constructs. Please. Um, just really quick, because I know we're almost out of time, I would say both a really good book, Cast, um, also the book, uh, the previous uh, person that asked the question by De Dana uh, Y. Matthews really explains the intersectionality of health law and racism pretty well. Um, Daniel Dawes has this book called Political Determinants of Health that is really good and, and, and it also kind of presents kind of the case of how racism interplays um, into and politics into poor health outcomes. And in terms of individual things, like if you had like a 30 minute presentation or one hour presentation or 90 minutes with your team, a couple of things that we think are probably helpful are the disrupt mechanism, which I think maybe Dr. Dudley was involved in, um, was one of the colleagues of Dr. Dodge and Dr. Faluzzi. They, they're two pediatricians that created this uh, framework to show people what to do in the moment when you're kind of ex experiencing or um, being a bystander of racism, how to speak up. And it has a very easy to remember kind of acronym with steps to kind of follow and how to address difficult conversations. And then um, there is a book, like how do we, I, there's a bunch right now, but how to be anti-racist, mm -hmm. right? They also kind of gather a bunch of these skills and present them in a way that makes potentially an everyday person feel more empowered to kind of speak up and start, you know, raising awareness of, you know, toxic cultures of uh, microaggressions and macroaggressions. Okay, thank you. Dr. Dr. Duche? Oh, it's, it's interesting. I think if you have that hour, I mean, I think you, you, just, you just talk about structural racism, but I think hopefully that organization is also open to more continued dialogue, right? Um, developing affinity groups, um, doing equity, you know, their equity tools, uh, racial equity tools that you that organizations can use, but I, I definitely think it's a more than one half hour meeting. So hopefully, an organization is open to more half hour meetings. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think 100 yeah. percent, right. definitely. Yeah. And last, so I am very visual. I recommend you go to, and I'm the research person I like to do. FDA has a really awesome website called the FDA Snapshots website. If you haven't heard it, if you guys haven't used it, go to the FDA Snapshots website, and you can clearly show anyone, this is the last drug that was approved. Here's where you can see how many Hispanics, African Americans, Asians, whites were enrolled in that study. Males versus females. That is the simplest way you can show a group that says, here is our problem. Right? And it's not a pharma issue, it's not a pharma company issue, it's a recruitment issue, it's an education issue for them to participate. So FDA Snapshots website is a great, easy to use tool. You can sort them by disease, you can sort them by uh, when the medication was approved, and you can see and show them, this is our problem. So use it, it's super simple, and I share it with people all the time. Thank you so much. Um, so the discussion about uh, racism as a public health issue doesn't end here. This is uh, basically a to be continued. Uh, I, I wanna thank each and every one of you for engaging in the kind of work that you're doing, uh, really within the realm of, of anti-racism and, and really trying to reduce the, the disparities that we see based on race, ethnicity. Thank you so much. Uh, so I would just want to remind everyone that uh, to, pl to please continue to enjoy the conference. Uh, we have a breakout session on a range of topics uh, uh, starting at 2.30. And don't forget to tweet about uh, the conference at hashtag CHCIHHM22. Thank you so much for please. being here. If, this has been a real pleasure. Real quick, I have a quick, quick have comment. A Let me get one th second, ma'am. I just have a really quick um, observation and comment. 
about talking about racism in the schools. I think that's something that um, the young lady uh, in the green spoke about. But I also think it's important to talk about it in your workplace as well. I work for Toyota North America in Plano. And that's something that we have begun to do more of, is be comfortable being uncomfortable talking about racism and diversity because mm -hmm. there's so many different, um, different perspectives, right? I think a lot of times people think that diversity just means you're black or you're Hispanic or you're white or whatever the mm -hmm. case may be, but it's also diversity of thought, right? Mm -hmm. And how people view things and how we view things in organizations and how different we are and that's what makes our organizations work, and that's what makes our organizations tick and thrive. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to share that because um, I think it's extremely important if there's students in here that you guys understand that even though, you know, when you're getting ready to go into the workforce, it's okay to talk about it, yeah. and it's okay to open up about it because it, it's a topic that definitely needs to be, to be discussed. So that was my comment. Thank and don't you. forget age and gender equality is the other one. Yeah. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So those are the other parts of the rainbow that we're missing. If you guys, myself, it's not even, I'm embarrassed to say this, it's a, it's a request. If you guys want to support what we're doing in our TV show to do more outreach, please come to me and talk to me about how you can support our foundation so that we can expand our TV show. Yeah. Wonderful. No Wonderful. shame in that plug. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.